And we're back with more of our best of slash favorite lists. I'm Chris. <clears throat> I'm Mark. Let's dig right into it. We already did all of our best pictures, so if you want to go back and watch the first two, and maybe three, I, and we, I might have to break it up a little bit in the editing. So watch the previous ones to this one. This will be either three or four. We'll figure yeah. that out later of the series. So if you want to see the best pictures, go back and look at those. Picking up here with best director. So the best directing job for you of all time. Any, regardless of genre, regardless just genre. best director, period, boom, done. Who is it? What is it? <clears throat> yeah, that was an easy call for me. Uh, yeah, if you had to pick one film, great directing, uh, and had an impact on the industry, uh, or in the art form, Akira Kurosawa, Seven Samurai, 1954, is an absolute... Um, masterful job mm -hmm. um, you have a guy who uh, notorious for even the weather you know well if I don't want rain uh, I want it sun he makes sure that certain scenes okay I don't want the there I want I want to cloud the sky on this particular sequence he makes sure he doesn't shoot that like it's a cloudless sky uh, or if he wants a scene where uh, it's windy he makes sure Oh, it's no wind today? All right, bring in the fans. I mean, this guy was controlling the smallest of things in his story. And then also, there's the script itself, the story itself. And you have uh, Seven Samurai with uh, a lot of interesting characters. It's not just like maybe follow one guy on his journey. This is, you've got a farming village. There's probably about five, six major characters in the farming village. Then you got the seven warriors, and then following all their stories and keeping up all of that is, you know, it, it takes some skill to handle mm. all these. The more characters you have in a film, the more skilled you need to be and patient you need to be to give everyone their moment. And Kurosawa does that. And then, of course, the action uh, for its day was certainly. Uh, well done, building the tension all the way up to the climatic third act. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, one of the things he did that was uh, innovative at the time was uh, what we call coverage. The idea of having multiple cameras set up so that um, he wanted he wanted these uh, the sets that they used to be authentic. So a lot of times in Hollywood they'll have a set that's oversized so they can actually get a camera crew in there. Well, when he went to a smaller, more realistic uh, size buildings, they couldn't get the cameras in there. So what he did was, so that the action could still be covered, he had multiple cameras all over the place. And that inspired people like uh, George Lucas, who also uses the multiple cameras uh, when he shoots things. So they're influential for many, many different reasons, uh, but Seven Samurai, I just think, as far as directing goes, is just tops. Well, it's a great multi-layered movie. Uh, classic epic filmmaking, but also introspective and all those kind of good things. Toshiro Mifune is my favorite uh, character and uh, pretty much my whole favorite thing in the movie. The old Terry Mifune character and his arc and everything else. I, I, that's my, I've always latched onto him when I watch that movie. Uh, my favorite, best director, favorite director, whatever, of uh, all time, before, or directing job or whatever. My favorite, uh, before I give my answer, my favorite director, period, are, I love Scorsese, I love Tarantino, I love Oliver Stone, and I love Mr. Paul Verhoeven. Paul Verhoeven is more influential on me than people probably will ever realize. It's short of you. Uh... My favorite for this list is Paul Verhoeven, RoboCop. Best direction ever. And I'll tell you why. Uh, what I love about Verhoeven is, 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 he said this in interviews, you know, about Basic Instinct and some of his other movies. Like, if they have sex, what else am I supposed to do but show them have sex in a movie? So if it's violent, and it's a violent thing happened, I have to show what happened. I have to be honest. So with RoboCop, I've talked about this before, RoboCop, to me, was the first movie that took the awesomeness and uh, the geekdom, or whatever you want to call it, of the whole Star Wars uh, movement that had been created ten years before it. And then took it and mixed it with 
the what where I was, you know, being born in seventy six, and you coming as you get older, it took that geekdom, for lack of a better word, and took it to the next level. It's like okay, you had the fancy, you had the PG and G stuff. Now let's take that same stuff and make it rated R. And he did that with RoboCop. It was really the first movie to really do that that way. I know you can make the argument of, of some other movies, but really that was, to me, the first one that really went that far with it. It was so violent, and it, it was sexual, and the characters were so overtly <laughs> evil. And Clarence Boddicker is one of my favorite villains of all time. More on him later. Uh, but uh, it just... The way he took something that could have been just a throwaway movie and made it so much bigger and better uh, um, with the violence, with the action, with the storyline, um, and just the, the way it's shot. It's shot uh, um, classically mm -hmm. in a lot of ways, but it's cut so efficiently, and the staging is so good. You know everything that's happening in the movie, and the way he uses sound... And we use lighting and then the mixture with the stop motion. And you, I've read reports that the, sh the shooting of it was actually horrible. And they thought they were making a horrible movie, the crew did. And when it came together, it came out to be this classic. And anyway, I mean, you had this guy controlling all that. And really, for me, and I'm sure somebody out there could argue against it, but for me, it was the first movie to do this of taking the sci fi, fantasy, eight year old mindset and take it into the next level with with the, with the as an adult or a, a teenager rather and I totally I'm, I'm lucky that I was I was able to watch it when I when I saw it and be the age I was and like grow with it mm -hmm. and he masterminded all that um, he's he's the, that is the most influential movie on me more so than Star Wars Robocop is hands down the most influential movie on me ever period I love that movie He's the man behind it. All the credit goes to him. So he's my obvious choice. Really, there's no other choice for me. <clears throat> Best well, directing job. No one either the way I do. I, I can totally see that answer. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Best actor, lead actor in any film. Yeah. Regardless of genre. Just so people know, we haven't really discussed these. So some of these I'm looking forward to because I don't know what your answers are going to be. Sure. So. Now we're into the really more we're, unknown territory. We are real. We should be. Like really I never off. told you the Verhoeven thing. That's the first time you've ever heard that. That was the first time I heard it. So, uh, uh, not terribly surprised. But uh, I wouldn't have been surprised if you'd said something like Martin Scorsese, Goodfellas. That would have surprised me right. either. But anyway, we're on the lead actor. Um, I think the best performance I've ever seen, lead actor, is uh, Daniel Day-Lewis and There Will Be Blood. And I almost want to apologize to people watching because I feel like we've, there's a couple about two or three movies we've seemed like we've hit a lot. So, uh, but you know, when their greatness is what it you is. You like it, you like it. If, uh, I, I think what Daniel Day-Lewis did as uh, Daniel Plainview, that character in There Will Be Blood, 2007, is just phenomenal is a great performance you he is so buried into that character you don't you don't you totally believe this guy uh, there's a the there's like this internal fire that burns with him start to finish and the unique uh, enigmatic quality of that script to not really flesh a lot of stuff out a lot of that's left our own to kind of what, what what is his motivations? What really did happen uh, in his hometown uh, that made him want to be far far away from that and strike it rich in the West and things like that? Those are those are questions that are just left for us. And in his performance, uh, so much is said by a look or a turn of a phrase. Um, I just I I, I can't. Uh, <clears throat> It's hard for me to think of a performance that's really much better than that, start to finish. Well, it'd be on my top ten or so list, uh, maybe higher. Uh, at least I'll just safely say it'll be on my top ten list. And you know I love the movie, and I'm totally uh, enamored with that character. So yeah, I'll say he's definitely probably top five material for me. But my favorite performance of all time, actor, any genre, is Gene Hackman in The French Connection. Uh, that's oh. my favorite of all time. One of my favorite. It's on my top ten list is the movie. Uh, again, I love the driven, obsessive hero. I love the flawed hero. I don't like the squeaky clean. 
uh, 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 Shining Knight heroes. I don't like the one type heroes. It's kind of what you've had the last 15 years or so. We've kind of had the hero who is the one. You know, Neo, and then uh, the and then you had Anakin, and then the, and, and all the stuff in the prequels, and you yeah. had the Frodo, and you those, can overdo and it for sure. I, I don't like those type heroes. I like they're flawed. They're real people. They're 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 they're, they're angry. They're obsessive. They're racist. They're sexist. They're whatever the case may be, just flawed, like a real freaking person. Yeah. And 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 and, uh, and in this movie, he didn't have all the answers. If you, I don't want to spoil the movie, you haven't seen it, but you know, it does not end with him just kicking ass and <laughs> and uh, taking down the bad guy. And it, he doesn't, he's he's not perfect, uh, but he's so engaging, he's so obsessive, and you totally take the ride with him. Um, to me, he's like my favorite. You know, I think it shows in the stuff I produce. That is the kind of hero I like, where they don't have all the answers and they're flawed. Mm-hmm. Uh, and that's that's what he represents. He's like the pinnacle of that. And it goes back to uh, Ethan in The Searchers. Obsessive, driven to his own detriment. Yeah. Those are my favorite type of characters. And the reason why they're, they're my favorite type of characters is because of performances like Gene Hackman that I saw at such an early age, and they grabbed me. And I just think Gene Hackman, for me, in The Wrench Connection, is my favorite favorite of all time. It, it's a great one, and out of a long career of his, yes. that's, that one still shines bright. Uh, best actress in the film. Lead, uh, lead actress. Lead actress. What what I, I feel like David Letterman. What did I say? I feel like David Letterman. Oh, lead yeah, yeah, yeah. Actress. Uh, uh, I think uh, Vivian Lee in Gone with the Wind, 1939, is kind of like the, uh, the gold standard, that performance. It's one thing, a lot of times, uh, actresses in particular, if you're attractive, it's almost like that's a detriment because no one wants to, everyone wants you to just be like the girlfriend roles or in the romantic comedies, whatever. Sure. You know, anything that's me or might, might make you, if you're very attractive, if you're doing a role that might make you look almost like a villain or make you look mm-hmm. bad personality wise, they don't. They, Studios are reluctant to, to put someone like that in there. It's much easier to put maybe someone that they think is more plain or whatever. Vivian Lee, it's like this. She she's naturally attractive. She does this role. She's not always likable. She makes bad, bad mistakes. She's real. She's authentic. Uh, but she kind of, she goes on a character arc of her own. Uh, Mesmer. Mesmerizing from start to finish. Mm-hmm. I, I think of all the. I, I just think her performance still. When you think of great performances, even today, it her performance stands as kind of a gold standard. Uh, you know that you can compare to. Well, yeah, she was good, but it was she as good as Vivian Lee, or was it or better than that? And I think that is a. a I can't really th- think of a bigger compliment to give her than that. Well, it's a movie star role. It's an iconic <clears throat> role. It's carrying an epic. And, you know, keep in mind this is 1939. This is a female carrying what is the biggest movie at that time of yeah, all time. Yeah, and it's three and a half hours. She has to carry she carries, the whole thing. She's a darn near every frame of the movie. Yeah, she carries the movie. It's kind of like a, it's a special gift to be able to carry entire movies. Uh, Jennifer Lawrence, uh, I've mentioned before, is a modern version of a, of, a, of an actress who can carry entire movies. She is the real deal, folks. She's the real deal. She's uh, attractive, but she's the real deal. Yeah, yeah she can carry an entire franchise, uh, and, and not every actor or actress can do that. So, for Vivian Lee, in the context of 1939, of a female in that era yeah. carrying a, the biggest movie of all time, mm-hmm. that's a hell of a way on the shoulder. You gotta keep in mind, it's easy to poo poo it because you're in 2014. Mm-hmm. Oh, it's an old movie. No, no, think about it when it was. It's a hell of a. I can't, I can't. Well, other actresses of that day were doing, most of the films they were doing were like, you know, rom coms. That's all they were. You know, yeah. so here she got a meaty role and just knocked it out of the park. I mean, it was, it was, a, it was a huge, 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 huge burden. To take on, and she she executed it, so I can't complain. My pick is probably I'm probably only one of like three guys who ever seen this movie, and I don't care because it's an iconic <laughs> role to me. Okay, uh, it's my favorite performance, and it's a lot for a lot of the same reasons of Gene Hackman. But and you're gonna probably 
fall out of your chair. Uh oh. Julia Armand, Samila's Sense of Snow, is my favorite okay. actress from. Uh, I loved her character. I loved her performance. Julia Armand is not mentioned in the top actresses of all time, pretty much ever. Yeah. Uh, that's a shame, I feel, because that performance was amazing. Um, for same with similar reasons. She was a flawed heroine. She was obsessive heroine. Uh, she wasn't a sex pot, and she didn't. It wasn't a character that depended on her sexuality or all that stuff. I mean, in fact, they dress her down and make her look slightly homely in the movie. They try to. They try to. I mean, she's still Jeremiah, and she was pretty hot, so, you know, they did the best they could. But she's so driven. And one of my and, and my favorite scene ever for an actress, there's a scene in the movie where her young stepmother is mm. giving her too much shit, and she's been taking it the whole movie. Yeah. And she grabs her by the throat and by the crotch. Slams her against the wall and tells her, Leave me alone. It's a very powerful, very powerful scene. I, there's a common theme. I love obsessive heroes, I love flawed heroes. Uh, and this, and she is an actress in that, that role. And there's not many of those uh, for, for the, the women to tackle. This is a rare one. It's a really good one. It's always stuck with me. In fact, uh, you recall I wrote a whole, or was writing a whole trilogy of movies, basically. Taking yeah. that character and a, yeah. a, and switching it up a little bit, extrapolating it into yes. a, a, a trilogy. Yeah, 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 yeah. A, a different character, but yeah. based on that character somewhat. And in fact, when we shot a thought on Chain, I gave the girl that movie to watch. Uh, the when Chandler, who was the lead actress in the Thought on Chain, I gave her Smiley Sense of Snow to watch and said, "That's who you need to." Sort of emulate like that toughness, yeah. that drivenness, because mm -hmm. that to me is the best example of an actress uh, going after it. Now I get people out there probably thought of a thousand other performances for an actress to grab onto, and but this is my favorite. This is my favorite. <clears throat> it fits what I like. Yeah. Well, I will say it's certainly the performance of her career. Yes, I, I, I will agree on that level. It's a forgotten movie, to be honest with you. It's a completely forgotten movie. Well, I'll never forget it. It's I, I have a copy of it, and I'll always have yeah, a copy yeah. Of it. It, it's one that uh, made an impression on you. It came out in '97, I think, and uh, yeah, it's just been one of yeah, you know, it's one, one of your of my, favorites. So. It's been for a long time. Sure. Like, I, I remember the time I couldn't believe she didn't get nominated. I was like, not, not Golden Globe, nothing, really, BAFTA, something. Anyway, well, I think it was a Canadian. A small film, and that might have hurt it because it didn't have maybe uh, enough mainstream uh, pull. Ever know. since then, I've kind of kept up with Julia Roman's career, and I, and I kind of see, oh, she's in, oh, she's in the movie, cool. Yeah. They, they haven't forgot her, and when she was in Benjamin Button, I was like, thank God they didn't forget her. They put her in a movie, Benjamin Button. Mm -hmm. She was in that. So, uh, if you're out there, Julia Roman, somebody out there loves you. That's me. <laughs> well, just throw that out there. All right, to be continued. <laughs>